Our mission in our company, which I'm proud to be a co-founder of, is a big one. Accurate prediction of patient response to cancer drugs using living tumor cells in 3D culture. Uh, we do that so that we can use those predictions for important things. Uh, first of all, to improve patient outcomes, and then uh, related to that is the reduction of healthcare costs, and then importantly for everyone in the room, the idea of, of using the same tool belt, if you will, to increase the success of drug development and clinical trials. So I think it's important to talk, talk about accurate, right? And it's kind of funny in a world or in a room of preclinical scientists to say that uh, we're really focused on the correlation of clinical outcome. Uh, how can you do that in, the, in a space for, for testing drugs that have not seen human uh, testing, right? So, so what's, when is that possible? Well, it's not the only thing that we compare to. And certainly when we compare our predictions against um, the response of a max, matched PDX model where we use the same tissue, it's very important. In addition, if we uh, can test a bunch of, uh, of tumors over time, we develop a profile and then we can compare the profile of response across many tumors to the aggregate response in a, in a, in a typical population. If, if our tumor population re resembles that, you know, we have some value in terms of value in our prediction. But nonetheless, patient outcomes are the gold standard. And I still would maintain that that is important to a, a, an audience of preclinical scientists. Um, as we develop accurate predictions of testable hypothesis, where we can actually have a response prediction in our system and then match it against an actual patient outcome, we zero in, if you will, on accurately predicting uh, drug response. And then we have a little secret strategy that I'll tell you right now uh, in comparison of a drug that's a preclinical candidate versus one that's regulated and, and approved as safe and efficacious. We just don't tell the cells what the regulatory status of the drug is. So as we uh, develop a broader models, the, it sort of bleeds into preclinical untested models, but the accuracy of our system is still maintained. Tough crowd, by the way. So uh, we really have then developed the art of picking the right question. So what is the question that we can ask in a complex 3D cell culture that has a testable hypothesis that we can then validate against in, in terms of patient outcomes? So we're a different kind of company, if you will, and, and, and if you haven't got that, I'm sure you will. Uh, necessary then for us to be successful is this emphasis on clinical relevance. And so what we do, even in the preclinical side, has to integrate with the clinic. And so um, uh, basically one, one part of the strategy that our company has adopted is actually going and living with doctors, right? So we are co-located inside this big complex, which is in Greenville, South Carolina. It's the 13th largest U.S. public hospital system. We're co-located with their cancer institute. And so every day when I go to work and I have to walk to the cafeteria to get a Starbucks, I'm walking past the phase one unit where patients are actually receiving phase one, uh, you know, participating in phase one clinical trials. And so uh, that makes it a lot easier to do a complex uh, problem. And um, those of you who know me know that I'm a dual citizen. I'm, I grew up in Canada and I was educated there in my bachelor's. I came here for graduate work. And so then as a, as a foreigner, if you will, but a consumer of U.S. healthcare, I used to make the joke that when we moved into the hospital about five years ago, I understood about 3% of U.S. healthcare and 97% was a mystery to me. Uh, the good news is my percent increased about 1% a year. So I'm up to about 90 or 92% understanding and, or 92% mystery and 8% understanding. It's complicated. Everything that is, happens in there is really complicated. And so by living and rubbing elbows and walking through that environment on a regular basis, we have a leg up as we try to think about ways that we can use our models that are eventually going to affect patients. And, and I'll tell you, being here in Boston is a great place and we're in and out a lot because of the activity here. Uh, it's been really neat to have some of our clients come down and tour and walk through our situation and walk through our, our clinical space of our clinical partner. And some of them who've you know, been, been for more than a decade designing clinical trials had not seen patients actually receiving chemotherapy and they had not really you know, been in there. And so it's a really kind of a unique environment and, and we're proud to have it. Second model is to get good advice. And this is an announcement we made in, in April, but we very carefully selected our scientific advisory board. And you see uh, the, the gentleman on the top and the bottom are both MDs. And if, if you're in the cancer world, you might recognize them. Dr. Carlos Arteaga is the immediate past president of AACR and a very talented clinician academic out of Vanderbilt University uh, with a lot of specialty in breast cancer research. On the bottom, we have Dr. Anil Sood, who comes from MD Anderson. And you might recognize him as the lead of their moonshot program for ovarian and breast cancer. So these are definitely thought leaders who we engage to make sure about our clinical relevance. In the middle, we have our local rock star, Dr. Uh, David Kaplan out of Tusk University, who 
my opinion, is, is, is the best, or if, if not, you know, absolutely at the top of um, academic tissue modelers for 3D tissue modeling. So we get a lot of good, good advice. So with that, we think about our work in the context of all the ways that you can do clinically relevant uh, uh, experiments. And you start with the patient, and so we're, we're thinking about, okay, starting with uh, patient-derived or primary tissue, that, that we call it tissue fluidity, as in you can move that, that tissue around, if you will, and you can move it into models like ours, this ex vivo 3D culture I'm showing here. Uh, as is the topic of a lot of dis discussion here, you can move it into mice and, p and patient-derived xenograft model. Or you can move it into freezers and, frankly, cryopreserve it live so you can go get it later. So once you have that uh, initial, if you will, tissue that you've taken from the patient and you've moved it somewhere, then you can kind of move it around, right? So recognizing that ex vivo 3D culture and, and PDX is, is not only a source of drug response testing, but is a source of expansion. So you can sometimes get more tissue. Uh, and then also you can, you can get it out of, uh, out of cryopreservation when you need it. So these are important things. They're not trivial, but we're doing them, and we're doing them actually rather well. So with this model, then, you can actually engineer some really neat preclinical and, and clinical uh, experiments, if you will. And so let's talk about those. So, so the, the first thing that we ever did was just the focus of incorporation of primary tumors, right? So uh, we're in a hospital. Uh, we have a relationship with, with this clinical partner and, and others where we're able to procure t primary tissue under IRB. Everything's approved. And then we either bring that into our system directly or cryopreserve it to bring it in later. And uh, a couple of notes. One is this requires specialized expertise. So not only mastering the process by which you get tissue, IRB approvals and uh, rationale and whatnot. Um, so there's something to that. It's not trivial. Uh, the second part is you have to have the patients to be able to take the tumors from. So then when we dif do different tumor types, it's the question of frequency of tumor and also availability. Some, some cells are being removed, some, some are not, depending on the indication. Um, one thing that we've really learned is the importance of the clinical annotations, and in my world, that's probably as important as the tissue itself, is the information about the patient at the time of sourcing, and then often, what happened to them after? What happened to them three months, six months after we got the tissue? So all of those are really important variables, but through mastering them, we get to do neat things, like answer questions, uh, sometimes preclinically, about a mechanism of action, about additional indications on, on different kinds of cancer, so, so the broadening of it will. Uh, if you will, and we're very active in these kinds of projects. A second kind of project involves the incorporation of propagated uh, tissue that, that has been propagated in PDX. And so as the tissue is being expanded, uh, that, that becomes a natural partnership. And so some people ask about that, and actually if you ask the, some of the PDX uh, folks in the room, they'll say that we're hitting them up for tissue. You know, like, hey man, you got any, you got any tissue of this type? Because frankly, we can get around uh, tissue availability problems if it's accessible in the PDX, and there's a lot of value there. We've established a very high take rate. So basically, when it's grown out in, in the mouse, uh, we can very successfully move that into our system, and, and that's important. Uh, one thing that's, that's active in, in terms of our, our world is the discussion of, can this be used as this pre-screen, if you will, for PDX models, help, me, help people select their PDX uh, model that they go forward with. And then remembering our gold standard is we really want to know what the patient would do. Uh, we, we sometimes don't have that. So then you get in this question of, you know, if, if we get different responses, who's right? But even with that, it's still a lot of valuable activity that's happening in these ki kinds of models. Um, another one that we can do is essentially patient match complex co-cultures, right? So from the same patient, can we diff get different kinds of cells, two or more kinds of cells? These can either come from the same tissue or from different tissues. And, and really, so we're thinking about recreating patients in these complex models, if you will. Uh, we can get them at different times, depending on when cells are being accessed. And the one that we've been longest uh, known for is tumor stroma. So this, in fact, is actually a picture of a, of a tumor stroma co-culture uh, in breast cancer that we were very successful at, at growing out. A uh, very recent one, and, and relevant to this meeting, is the idea of immuno-oncology. And so uh, you can build these tumor immune models, if you will, uh, in a very exciting way and, and incorporate different kinds of immune cells, depending on what you can access to. Um, I'll tell you, as a CEO, I, I, I go back from these meetings and I'm all excited about thinking about what models we're going to build. And I have a very good team uh, there who's, who's, who uh, tempers my enthusiasm. And when I went home the, previously and said, you know, we've got to do a tumor immune uh, model and we've got to show, uh, if you will, immune activation in it, they came back to me with very reasonable and logical uh, points that said that we needed to learn how to isolate those, the, the cell types repeatedly, need to characterize it. We need to understand the ratios of the, of the mixture. 
what's going to happen when we do what, and you know, we, before we even throw a drug on it, you know, we, we have to have some basic uh, knowledge of the system. Uh, we put this out at a poster in ACR to say we actually have that knowledge of the system now, and here you're seeing patient-matched immune oncology models. We're from the same patient. We took tumor cells and immune cells of, of different kinds. Uh, you can see uh, T cells on the top and macrophages on the bottom. What we see is that there is interaction between them. So basically, with increasing concentration of T cells, um, you get a, a reduction in tumor viability. So you would want to know that before you do you throw a drug in there that your effects coming from your drug. And we actually see uh, the opposite effect with increasing macrophages. So we publish this, and then I can actually say, as of yesterday. Uh, we have now thrown drug in this system, so we don't have the data yet. But uh, you know, hopefully, uh, before next year, you'll probably see that out. But maybe I'll be back next year telling you about specifics about what we've got from that model and how it works. Um, and uh, Tanuja said, talk a little bit about trends and what you're seeing happening. This is not necessarily about us, but, I'm, uh, but we're demonstrating the value of live cryopreservation. And academic institutions are really getting on board to say, ah, there's value in establishing this because we can get a lot more out of our tissues that we're archiving anyway. And so, um, and, they, and they also have clinical annotations, and as I said, that's so important. Um, and so this is sort of a, a trend, if you will, that I see. And then the last one I'd say is, um, again, we don't tell the cells what the regulatory status of the drug is, so the use of our, these methods for clinical trials, I'll tell you, is definitely coming, and we're in, in some of those discussions about the potential to either uh, do ex vivo response-based selection or enrollment into trials, uh, which I think has a lot of, of, of potential value, um, adaptive or clinical trial design, so basically once they're in, are there things that we can learn in parallel from the tissue that we're taking to, from them during the trial? Or, for example, integration with post-treatment biopsy analysis where they're taking a biopsy after drug effect and we can see if we can model that out. So there's a lot of really interesting things that we can do with these systems. Um, I was proud to announce this morning a, a collaboration, which is maybe the, the last thought I'll put out there, is to say, uh, this is a collaboration we announced this morning with the Mayo Clinic. Uh, in terms of, uh, if you will, marrying our complementary ovarian programs where they have an ongoing PDX uh, clinical trial where the recognition is the complementarity of these two technology platforms is actually really powerful and can send out the benefits of that trial uh, beyond you know, where they are now in terms of a different data source, an independent parallel data source, and all the good things that happen from that. So I'm uh, really proud to announce that, and that comes from a great relationship at, at Mayo. And uh, if you will, another trend that I'll say is I think now that the science here has developed where we can get into these complex uh, collaborations and strategic partnerships. And uh, you know, that's, I guess, a little bit of my prediction for what's coming down the pipe as well.